After checking the tape, what are the final thoughts in regards to the Dolphins' defensive performance against the Chargers? How much long-term concern should there be? That's the focus here today on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami, welcome to another episode of Locked On Dolphins. It's your team every day here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked On Dolphins, co-host of Locked On NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Shout out to our everydayers who do keep it locked in with us on a daily basis because we don't have to say it. we live it here on the Locked On Network. Today on the show, got uh, an opportunity for us to kind of dive into the tape. We checked the tape, the all 22, and I actually started with the defensive side of the ball because I knew there was going to be some big time questions as, as it pertained to the viability of the performance the Dolphins put on, how much long-term concern there should be. So that is our focus today. Today's episode of Lockdown Dolphins is brought to you by Prize Pick, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code in all lowercase Locked on NFL and get a good first deposit match up to $100. So let's focus first on who played before we talk about how they played. We really have to dig into who took the snaps, why players did and did not take the snaps, uh, where it could go from here. And there's a few players that I I think Miami is going to need more uh, more from long term if this Dolphins defense is going to be what we think it's capable of, and I'm obviously not talking about a player like Jalen Ramsey who's on injured reserve, uh, I'm focused more so on Brandon Jones and David Long because they played a combined 19 snaps against the Chargers. And you understand why Brandon Jones didn't really play because Brandon Jones is still recovering from the ACL injury that he had midseason last season. The Dolphins have been weaning him back gradually. He got a few reps, just two defensive snaps. Now, he did take special team snaps, so he played about 20 snaps total if you include his special team snaps. But two defensive snaps, and they were both in short yardage. Heavy personnel. Where he ultimately ends up growing, I think, has the potential to uh, create more benefit for Miami, or more ambiguity with what they're doing on the back end, uh, specifically in early down situations, first and tens, uh, where, where you kind of have the threat of run or pass. Uh, but Brandon Jones and his continued uh, rebound from the ACL injury and the recovery and making sure they're ramping him up appropriately is one that I will be watching, and I'm really eager to see how much he plays against New England just to get a feel for how that progression is going. Uh, David Long, on the other hand, uh, he played in your base defense. He was not on the field in nickel. So if you want to know why he played 17 snaps, he was not a part of the four down linemen, two linebackers, five defensive backs group. Why that was, was that we want more physicality and size for Andrew Van Ginkle. Was that assignment based? I'm not sure. Uh, But what I know is that if the defensive line can sort itself out, and it's going to have to, whether it's the people who are here or signing aging veterans who can help you in a rotational role uh, or the continued gelling of the entire unit altogether under a new defensive system. David Long's ability to knife into gaps, I I do think brings value uh, versus Andrew Van Ginkle. I, I, Thought Andrew Van Ginkle, who played 51 defensive snaps. Obviously, this is a team that's going to live in nickel. So you got to you got to get the reps and you got to get those guys figured out who's going to take those opportunities. Um, There's so much more range and upside. Now, the interesting counter to that is the Dolphins, I thought, from a coverage perspective, played pretty well. You had Jerome Baker lost track of Austin Eckler on a play action pass. Uh, for a big gainer, you had in base defense, David Long bumped out on Keenan Allen in the slot. Deshaun Elliott drifts and tracks with the post. So they what, what the Chargers ended up doing was running the outside most receiver ran a post. 
and Keenan Allen, the slot, ran an out and up. And David Long, because they were in base defense, was kind of pushed out on the hash and responsible for Keenan Allen and flat responsibility. Well, Keenan Allen you know, runs the short out, and David Long pushes with him, but then he turns up the sideline, so now you got to carry him. And because the Chargers' outside receiver ran a post, it ran Deshaun Elliott out of there. And that's what created, right after Zach Sealer missed the third and five sack, that was on the first possession for the Chargers after the, the turnover in the red zone for the Dolphins, that fresh set of downs after Justin Herbert scrambled for the first down was then when they flipped the field and hit hit that 40-plus yard throw to Keenan Allen. So that's what happened on that play. Uh, the... So, so for David Long's perspective, what is it going to take for you to get on the field in, in the nickel personnel? I don't know. Um, I did think Jerome Baker was probably more consistent with his reads and more consistent playing off of blocks uh, than what. Here's what I'll say about the linebackers. I'll boil it down to this. Jerome Baker's going to stay on the field because I think he was more consistent with his reads than Andrew Van Kinkle, who's playing stack off ball linebacker for the first time. And case in point, Jerome Baker played 80 snaps. He was one of three defensive players who played every snap in the game, along with Javon Holland and Sean Elliott. And I think he's going to stay on the field over David Long because I think he dealt with contact better against a really good Chargers offensive line than David Long. So Baker's probably the staple. But between Van Ginkle and David Long, you're going to have to ask yourself, what, what do you need to get the $6 million a year player on the field because that would be my expectation. Now, I, I think the Dolphins, in spite of Andrew V. Giggles' inexperience, they did some nice things in coverage. I don't necessarily know how much of Andrew V. Giggle that came back to. I have some thoughts on it. We'll, we'll get into it when we get to run defense and, and coverage execution. Um, big time workload for your defensive tackles. There were 80 snaps played. Wilkins played 67. Zach Sealer played 64. Raekwon Davis was down to 45 snaps. Understandably, he's third in the pecking order. Uh, they rotated him uh, when the Dolphins went with some of their even fronts. Um, but that's exactly what I would expect that snap distribution to look like. Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb, 70 and 72 snaps. Phillips, 72. Chubb, 70. Uh, Emmanuel Agbo played 18. Uh, your next in line on edge, guys, was uh, I guess technically you have Van Ginkle in, in that uh, group as well who took a couple of snaps on the edge. So those are the four guys that played there. I'm a little concerned about what Emmanuel Agba showed, if we're being honest. Uh, Gerald Everett, as a tight end, uh, took his lunch money a couple of times in, in running fits, and, and that's really where you'd expect Emmanuel Agba to have a, a, a firm advantage. Uh, but you need Emmanuel Agba, I think, to probably get in a place where you feel comfortable with playing him, but the, the the performance has to be better than what it was this past week against the Chargers for that to be the case. Uh, Xavier Howard, Cater Kohu, 78 snaps apiece. Zach Sealer, we mentioned 64. Eli Apple, 60 snaps. You want to get an idea for how much nickel the Dolphins played their third corner was Eli Apple who played 60 snaps. And I thought he played pretty good, if we're being honest. Didn't really get a lot of targets uh, thrown his way. Didn't really get tested a whole bunch. Uh, four targets, two receptions for 20 yards for Eli Apple. So all things considered with the Jalen Ramsey injury and Cater Kohu, you know, pushing inside to play the nickel. I think Cater was one of the standouts of the game. We'll, we'll get to performers here next on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. But just from a snaps perspective, a couple of the guys that played a handful of snaps, Justin Bethel played nine, obviously was in on the sack at the end of the game to seal the game. Brandon Peely played eight. Duke Riley played one. And that's your gauntlet. Uh, the Dolphins had 18 total players take defensive snaps. So uh, they, they, there was a concentrated effort to keep your best players out on the field, which I applaud. But there's a pathway for how this performance gets better, and we, we have to talk about that. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, with the uh, run defense performance for the Dolphins and, and what I thought I saw when I evaluated the film. That's next here on Locked on Dolphins. Before we go any further, NFL season is officially here with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get up to $200 in bonus bets. Guaranteed, if you like good ROI, that's a good place to start. Plus, all customers who bet $5 can get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. 
Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is super easy to use. You can bet on everything, the spreads, player props, and everything in between. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you do not want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So as far as the run defense, <laughs> uh, it was not good. I think that's probably the best place to start. Uh, it was not a good performance. The Chargers uh, got a lot of movement on the interior. Uh, I thought Christian Wilkins, Here, I'll start with the good. For as quiet as Christian Wilkins was versus the last time the Dolphins played the Chargers. I actually thought upon further review and watching the film, Christian Wilkins had the right balance of controlling the offensive linemen, creating penetration, getting to gaps. And of course, with his athleticism and mobility, he has the ability as a run defender to bend back if he beats you early and still play that quote unquote gap and a half. I am wondering how much more you can get the rest of the group to play on the plus side of the line of scrimmage. Now, credit where credit is due. From the Chargers' perspective, those guys got a lot of one on one wins. They ran a lot of power. They ran a lot of lead with the tight ends. Uh, they are kicking out your defensive ends and comboing up uh, for, off the weak side of the formation. So you're changing the formational strength, which with Miami living in nickel means you really got to be on your P's and Q's and you really got to squeeze and condense. And it was just like a, everything felt like a tick off and everything felt like you were half a step out of where you needed to be. So I think it was an execution issue just as much as anything else. But as I watched Christian Wilkins and I watched Jalen Phillips, I think those are the two guys in the front that I watched with the most consistency who utilized their length, utilized their functional power, utilized their explosiveness, created positive disruption for the front. It was just not a complete effort. And there was a lot of double teams with guys that were getting worked and turned and uh, I, I thought Zach Sealer created stalemates and anchored sufficiently. I thought Christian Wilkins positively handled doubles on the interior, and I did not think Raquan Davis handled those particularly well. So for this Dolphins defense, that nose tackle spot to be able to that, like that that at times is a true two gap responsibility, and he's getting turned out. He's trying to turn out of double teams, and then he's he's getting his pads written up, and then he starts getting walked out of a gap. There has to be a better balance of playing on the plus side of the line of scrimmage. So as I'm watching that game back from a defensive front perspective, that was the number one thing. And if you want to watch how I think it should be played, if you get a chance to go back and watch the game, just watch 94. Because he was quiet in the first quarter. And then lo and behold, he starts popping up again and again and again. And he's flashing, and he's close. Credit to Zach Sealer, though, on the uh, third and two shovel pass that the Dolphins forced the punt with, uh, where they tried to shovel pass to Quentin Johnston. It was Zach Sealer anchoring against a double team that held and created the bubble, and it was Christian Wilkins who created the penetration and forced the pitch to Quentin Johnston to happen quick instead of continuing to invite the rest of the defense up out of the way. Jerome Baker on that play gets downhill, fills into a gap, attacks a pulling offensive lineman, rips across his face, and actually is able to get the tackle on Quentin Johnston, who runs in the back of his blocker because Zach Sealer holds the point of attack. So there were these flashes of good. It just didn't happen enough on first and 10. First and 10 killed me. Because in this defense, the objective is you want to win first down, so then you get into obvious passing situations. And you saw at the end of the game what it looked like and what it should look like if you indeed do that. Now, what's interesting is Jalen Phillips was asked after the game, and he came straight out and said, we didn't earn the right to rush the passer. Because what you do on first down is going to provide and feed you the opportunities to hunt on third down. 
So it needs to be more consistent wins. You need more positive reset of the line of scrimmage with, the, again, the ability to double back off. I thought it looked too much like a Josh Boyer, Brian Flores defensive execution from the defensive line. Kind of lock, peak. We're going to hold. I'm going to try to dis. It was too passive. And then you don't have the bodies behind it to give you the reinforcement. So the back can make you wrong as a linebacker when you, you're trying to cut and there's two backers back there and everybody's trying to, to hold up and, and read you. There were a number of times where Austin Eckler's playing peekaboo coming out of the, pet, the mesh point. One of the backers gets downhill in a hurry. The other one's trying to scrape exchange over or scrape and flow over the top. And you've, I've got the B gap open and I got the D gap open. And I'm going to stick my foot outside. My defensive tackle is going to start to stick his head outside because that's the lock peak shed technique. Well, the linebacker is going to push it and head to the B and then boom, I'm going to stick my foot in the ground and I get north. And that's exactly what happened on that 55 yard touchdown or that 55 yard run from Austin Eckler. So as the Dolphins go from here, I think the execution up front has to be more consistent and more in line with what it's supposed to look like. So some scheme growing pains. Do I think it will always be like this? No. If I look at all the teams that you could possibly play and who's up next for who you better get it figured out in a hurry against, it's probably the New England Patriots are near the top of the list. So you got to figure it out. Maybe you make some formational changes. Maybe you make some scheme changes. Maybe you create a certain package. I, I think there's... A lot of upside for what can change, but it has to evolve. Because I think if if the mentality of the front is what it was against the Chargers, you are going to give up 150 rushing yards a game. And you don't want to live in that world. So I'm very eager to see what the evolution is and, and how the execution of it up front changes after going back and watching the All-22. Uh, we uh, have to talk about the pass coverage. And in particular, there was one standout for the Dolphins that uh, I think has officially arrived. And we're going to talk about that next year on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Before we go any further, though, Prize Picks, one of our sponsors of today's show, Prize Picks is the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's you against the numbers, not you against thousands of other players and pros and sharks and smart money. None of that. You pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in as you get the numbers right. As an example, this week on Prize Picks, I'm going to go Saquon Barkley more than 60 rushing yards, and I'm certainly going to bet on the Chiefs to bounce back. So I'm going to go with Patrick Mahomes more than two passing touchdowns as well. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for first deposit match up to $100. That is prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports done right. Javon Holland is here, y'all. He had a heck of a game. Javon Holland was a absolute stud. And it was perimeter support in the passing game against the screen game. I thought the Chargers did a lot of nice things with what they were able to do to put these tight ends and Mike Williams out on the, uh, on the outside in stack formations and try to throw quick throws to the perimeter and utilize their size against the Dolphins' smaller DBs. I would expect you'll see the New England Patriots try to do some of that as well. Well, Javon Holland from uh, a high alignment is getting downhill in a hurry, and he is tackling dudes at the line of scrimmage. He is in some of your short yardage situations, getting down close to the box, shooting the B-gap for tackles for loss. He is all over this Dolphins Chargers tape. And he was everything you possibly hoped Javon Holland could be when you found out that Javon Holland was going to be playing with Vic Fangio's defense. Now, I think tempo gave you some problems in the passing game. There was not a lot that the Chargers were, were really able to positively create. Xavier Howard had uh, a couple of overly physical reps. 
against Keenan Allen. I thought the the second uh, pass interference that they called on Howard when the ball was already down inside the five was bogus. But the first one probably was DPI. And then the holding, I think, was convenient that they called it holding because I didn't think the ball was catchable, but it was technically by the letter of the law contact outside the contact window. So um, I do think communication and having answers for tempo is going to be important because there were a number of occasions where the Chargers get a chunk gain and they get up on the ball and the Dolphins are kind of still talking it out. So you you got to have kind of a de facto call. Uh, that everybody kind of understands and can get into when you get tempo uh, to hopefully at, at least get yourself lined up because the Joshua Kelly touchdown run, like the Dolphins weren't even lined up. Half the guys were looking at each other, trying to talk and get the calls right, ball snap, touchdown. So from a coverage perspective, there were a couple of occasions where um, you didn't tackle and it was quick throws to the perimeter. So just making sure everybody's ready, everybody's got their calls. And obviously this is a defense that is predicated on a ton of communication. So you understand that that is a, a logistical challenge when teams give you tempo. But what whatever your answer is, I would have one because I expect that the Patriots are probably going to mirror some of that based on the success that they had. Now, performers, Cater Kohu was another stud. Uh, obviously had the sack on the nickel pressure. And the Chargers did the Dolphins some favors with some of their three by one formational splits because they were pushing this, this three strong receiver. The three was in pretty close proximity to the offensive tackle. And when you elect to bring pressure in that regard from a nickel or a dime player, like you did when Justin Bethel scored the sack coming through the B gap on the uh, final play of the game for the chargers. In both of those instances, that three receiver was, in close proximity to, tie, to the, the offensive tackle. So when you are getting ready to pressure, it's really hard to identify because the surefire tell in coverage when you're bringing the defensive back in pressure is when you have two DBs stacked directly over top of each other. But if that formation brings those nickel and dime corners in close to the offensive tackles, you can provide the safety leverage over the top much cleaner without tipping your hand. And that's what when, when Cater Kohu hits his successful sack, and he also, on the same possession, uh, had an excellent, excellent, excellent tackle on the perimeter against Mike Williams on a quick throw to the perimeter. It's one of the times where the Dolphins did tackle well. You get Gerald Everett out there catching them, uh, kind of a challenge. You get the the orbit motion with Keenan Allen out there, and he out leverages you the perimeter. Well, well Cater Kohu click and close against Mike Williams, of all people, uh, Gator Kohu getting into the fit uh, as well, really physically challenging guys like Josh Kelly in the run fit too. So Kohu, I thought was a major standout. You look at the plus performers for the Dolphins defense. I think almost all of them played on the back end other than Christian Wilkins and Jalen Phillips. Speaking of Jalen Phillips, since we're talking pass coverage and from a pass rush perspective, seven pressures, uh, he was about one inch away from a strip sack. <laughs> Uh, he had one where he turned the corner and flattened, and it was a forced incomplete throw where Javon Holland sorts out the running back coming out of the backfield uh, to switch outside and carry Austin Eckler on a rail route up the sideline in the second half and stays leveraged over the top in his good position to combat the throw. Phillips was like that far off from as Herbert is throwing the ball clipping the ball out of the back of hands, uh, back of Herbert's hand in the, at the back of his release. He like, I think he touched the ball in Herbert's hand in the delivery. It was that close. So Phillips was really close. Obviously he was a big part of the close at the end of the game. So I like that performance as well. Uh, uh, the other thing with Jalen Phillips that stood out to me was he slipped a couple times on the turf where I thought he had the one where Christian Wilkins gets early penetration and Herbert steps up in the pocket, then tries to flush right and actually falls down and goes to his knee and then has to get back up and get outside. Like Phillips had him dead to rights, but his third step as he's trying to get vertical and spike to Herbert, he's also having to, to bend 
around the offensive tackle and his foot slips in the turf and then he kind of stumbles and Herbert gets outside him. and you can kind of see a visible reaction from Phillips how frustrated he is that, that he didn't get that close so for all the talk about the sacks obviously the offense had three uh, Jalen Phillips after the game saying we didn't earn the right to rush the passer I think there's a lot here where you look at first and ten is the story for the Dolphins defense and how much better they can play on first and 10 is really going to dictate how much more of the end of game against the Chargers defense you can see because it's there and it's super exciting. I think we probably would love to get a little bit better execution against the run, obviously. And then you can start to see those second and tens. And I thought the Chargers did a really nice job as this game unfolded. I'm watching the action reaction uh, counter from Vic and Kellen Moore. I thought it was a very well coached matchup. And you're not going to get that every week. And hopefully that's another element of this where the Dolphins can uh, get after their opponents. But that is going to do it for me on this episode of Locked On Dolphins. We have an offensive recap coming uh, later today as well. So it's a double dip day. I'm doing all the all the all 22. Uh, but wanted to answer the defensive questions first because I know that's where everyone's head is at. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm Kyle Krabs, lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host here on Locked on Dolphins. It is your team. Every day, fins up. I appreciate you guys for checking out the show. Make it a good one. I'll talk to you all again later today to talk about the sustainability of the Dolphins' offensive performance from week one throughout the rest of the season.